before I begin this morning, I'm going to kneel once more in prayer. I just invite you to bow your heads with me, please. Father in heaven, Lord, I ask that you would use me this morning. Lord, I pray that my own faults, the words I may misuse, would not be a hindrance to the truth that is in your word that you intend to reach hearts and souls with today. So again, Father, I pray that you would use me, that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. A doctor of medicine that for the purpose of this story, we're going to call him Iggy. Uh, upon concluding his formal studies, decided to specialize in obstetrics. And later he was appointed the chief resident for the first obstetrical clinic at the Vienna General Hospital. Now this hospital had two clinics. Uh, the first was staffed by formally trained physicians, and the second clinic was staffed by midwives. Uh, but something wasn't right at this hospital. Iggy had an issue. While the maternal mortality rate due to uh, pure apparel, uh, fever, was 3% in that second clinic, the one uh, where the services were provided by midwives, that maternal mortality rate in the first clinic where they had the trained physicians was 500% greater. Now, the difference was no secret. The entire town knew about it. And so expectant mothers would actually specifically request to be in the second clinic with the midwives only and not in the first because the first clinic was the one where mothers didn't return from. They would be beg to be in that second clinic and Dr. Iggy, in, in some of the writings that we have from him, uh, recounts a mother begging on her knees to be transferred from the first clinic to the second one for fear of what might happen to her there. Others even opted to give birth on the street outside of the hospital instead of going in to that first clinic because of the statistics and because of what they feared there. Now this issue really plagued Iggy and the stats were undeniable and the loss of life was completely unacceptable to him and so what kept him up night after night was trying to solve this issue, trying to figure out what it was that allowed mothers to have a greater chance of success at life in this second clinic with the unprofessionally uh, trained midwives in the first one. So he began looking at every difference between that first and second clinic. One of the first things he considered was, was it overcrowding that was leading to the problems? Well, no, it wasn't, because the second clinic always had far more patients than the first. They had much more, uh, far less space between all of them. Could it have been the climate? No, the temperature was about the same in both of the clinics. He learned that the midwives had uh, the laboring mothers on their sides and the doctors had the mothers laboring on their backs. And so he made this clinic-wide uh, decree that all the mothers were to labor on their sides from, from here moving forward. But there was no difference. Still, more mothers died in the first clinic than in the second. He noticed that at the first clinic that priests would stroll the halls and ring bells every time a mother would die. And he thought, maybe it's invoking this fear in them, and it's all too much. And so he went to the priests, and he said, lay off the bells. Let's cut that out and see what happens. Still nothing. No change, no difference. Continually perplexed. Iggy, Iggy was desperate for a solution. And he 
experienced a breakthrough when a pathologist friend of his died after performing an autopsy on one of the deceased mothers. It was at that moment that he realized that in the first clinic where they had these trained doctors that the doctors were performing autopsies in addition to the births. And in the second clinic, the midwives, they didn't do any autopsies, weren't trained for it. So perhaps he thought the doctors were passing little pieces of corpse, is the way that he wrote it out, between uh, the deliveries. Now at the time, this was an insane idea. You know, it's almost like uh, uh, black magic kind of a thing, that because you've touched a dead person that you're transferring their death onto a living person. Uh, so it, it was um, very, very crazy, yet Iggy went forward with it and he concocted a foul-smelling solution that turned the noses of the doctors and the patients, and he proposed this strange new practice of applying that solution between autopsies and deliveries. And again, it was a clinic-wide uh, mandatory thing that every doctor must do this. And so they did, and the mortality rate dropped by 90%. What followed was Iggy blamed the doctors for the previous unnecessary deaths, and he became fascinated with this little pieces of corpse idea. Still something that was quite strange for his colleagues. It was unexplainable. Iggy spoke out vehemently against the issue of working with the deceased and, then, and the living. And eventually, due to politics and likely his personality, he lost his job. He wrote frequently about his findings, but he was largely unbelieved. He was rejected. And he was driven to insanity as to why these simple practices were not being widely accepted. Eventually, he was brought to an asylum where he was told he was being brought to consult with some of the new patients that were there. It turned out he was the new patient. And when he realized that he tried to fight his way out, but instead he was beaten by the guards severely, put in a straitjacket and placed in a darkened cell alone. After 14 days, Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis died from the very thing that he fought so hard against, a simple blood infection that led to a deadly fever brought on by little pieces of corpse, or as Louis Pasteur would uh, call them 20 years later, germs. The solution that Dr. Semmelweis concocted was chlorine and lime. In the strange practice, was washing their hands with it. Iggy was ignored and he was hated because the solution he offered didn't fit with their established practices and methods of understanding. And despite the physical evidence, despite the fact that the mortality rate dropped even as significantly as 90% was not enough. They simply resumed their non-hygienic practices until more evidence was given many years later. Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis would later be named the savior of women for his work on antiseptic theory. But what I want to tell you this morning is that there is another even greater savior that not only offers the solution to save the lives of laboring mothers, but has the solution for every living creature and the entire universe. God the Father in love and care for humanity sent his son, Jesus, to live a life as a model for us. That we would see the joy and hope that is possible when we follow the direction of God. Jesus was also rejected, beaten, and suffered, dying for us taking the heavy guilt of all of our sins and placing them upon himself. 
so that we would not have to. Now, God gives us a simple formula, a concoction, if you will, and this one is not very smelly. It is this. When we look to the uh, book of 1 John chapter 3, verse 4 tells us that sin is lawlessness or the breaking of God's law. What is sin? Lawlessness. This breaking of the law. And Romans 6, 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. Now, this is one of the things that is that should be very, very simple to us, but yet we try to make it very complicated. So I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible for us this morning. What it means is that the directions that God has given us, not only in, uh, through the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, but also the words of His appointed prophets and the example of, uh, of Christ Himself in living as a human, all of these things are given for our benefit. That when we follow those directions, we will avoid death. We will avoid the thing that will cause us harm. Too often we look at the, the life of Christ, the, thing that he call, the things that He calls us to, as something other than uh, instruction or direction given out of love. And that's a mistake. When we follow the simple guidelines, we will steer clear of the things that will bring us harm. And it should be as simple to us as washing our hands of the germs. We know that they cause problems. We know that they can hurt us. We know that they can make us sick. And what God has given to us through His Word, through those commandments, through that direction, and through the life of Christ, is an example by which we can avoid the things that hurt and damage. The rest of Romans 6.23 tells us the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now we might imagine that uh, in a similar way that perhaps Dr. Iggy was feeling about the people not washing their hands. It was such a simple thing to do. It wasn't as if they had to, I don't know, relearn some uh, you know, crazy, uh, long, uh, deep thought. It was a very basic practice. And the solution had two parts in it. That people were refusing to do it. That no doubt what drove him to insanity was saying, why won't you just wash your hands? If it means the difference between life and death, why not just do it? That we might imagine that God, while not being insane, is having this equal struggle of reaching out to us time and time again with method after method, over and over saying, why will you hurt yourself when I have given you a way to be joyful, to have peace, to have a positive life, why do you make these decisions when I've given you guidance away from these things? He has given us message after message, writing after writing, experience after experience to communicate some of these most basic things. Let me summarize two texts for you. John 10.10 10 basically tells us simply, I want you to have life more abundantly. I want you to have a fulfilling life while you are living it right now. In 2 Peter 3, 9, I don't want any single person to die. I want you to live. If there were some basic concepts about who God is, it should be these two things. That God wants us to have a positive and joyful life and that He wants everyone to live. He doesn't take joy in anyone dying. And here is the way that we can experience that life. We can imagine that God says to us, I want you to recognize that I care about you, that I love you. That the hurt of this world is not my doing, and that I am offering a solution to all of its problems. And I also want you to know that this hurtful place will not be around much longer. A better system is on its way. Therefore, I want you to take that I have clearly laid out for you 
And in so many ways, in any manner in which you like to learn, if you're a visual learner, if you're, uh, you learn best by listening, by audio, you learn best by reading, in every way imaginable, the truth of who I am is available to you. So I want you to take these directions, these commandments, these practices that I have established for your time, and I want you to utilize them to make a connection with me. Because when you have a connection with God, then the rest of what it causes us problems should fade away. And no matter what takes place, we will always have that connection there that we can remember that hope is coming soon. A connection to God who is the source of all joy and happiness. Many reject God like Dr. Iggy was rejected because the solution is too simple. It's too simple. It can't be as easy as simply washing our hands that would affect the mortality rate so much. Can't be yet. It's too easy. That we look at our own lives and we look at the spirit, our spiritual matters and we say it can't be as easy as having a relationship with God. Just spending time with Him. That's it. Just getting to know this God that created me. Is that really all there is to it? And so we try to overcomplicate it. We try to, um, uh, we, we feel like there's not enough hoops to jump through, so we add some. Uh, it, it, it's as if there is not enough penance that we have to pay. It's got to be harder on us, and so we make it harder. We add to it. We add to our misery. We make our lives harder because we feel like we have to pay the price. Because nothing comes easy, right? It's different with Christ. We don't have to pay the price because Jesus paid the price. Amen. He set the example. He took our guilt for wrongdoing and it killed him. It killed him, but he took it so that we will not have to bear it. Why do we do it? Continue to do it. It killed him, but he arose from that death, and after a while he went to heaven where he is now continuing to labor for us so that all we have to do is the simple steps of getting to know him and apply his guidelines to our lives. Every aspect of Christianity, every system and practice throughout his word was put there for a reason. The things established by God, like the Sabbath and the gathering of the man in the wilderness, the sanctuary, all of it was to point to Christ, to the loveliness of God. And yet other things were given throughout His Word, like feasts and ceremonies, to point to events that have since been fulfilled, but still yet with the purpose of maintaining a closeness to our Creator. Essentially, throughout the history of humanity, God has always given us many ways in which we can connect with Him and point to the things that are going to be happening soon so that we know that this is how close God is to us. There were things that happened in the Old Testament time that were for the people in the Old Testament time. And yet there are things that remain for us in our present time. Again, still set there in place so that when we learn about it, we can use it to grow that much closer to God. Prophecy continues to lay out for us the future, the hope of a soon coming return of our Savior and the perfection of a new world sin free. During this Easter weekend, we should certainly think on Christ and His sacrifice for us. It is incredibly significant. But we should also think about it for its qualities of relationship building that it allows. Because we don't have to have the burden of our guilt on us anymore, we are now more free to have that connection with God. And we should also remember that spiritual structures that He has established for us, like church, like the Sabbath and communion, are all here for our benefit. And they should point our minds to Him 
who gave it to us. Now today we have the privilege of celebrating communion together and one of the practices that God established for us is the ordinance of humility. Now God knew that a lack of humility would be a detrimental problem for humanity. And we can recognize that, can't we? A lack of humility, an issue for humanity. Selfishness is a rotting disease of humanity for which humility is the answer. Can you imagine what our world would be like if everyone were less selfish? Think of the things we could accomplish together. At the Lord's Supper, something happened that allowed God to set something up for us to solve this humility issue that we currently face. We know that Jesus and all the disciples, they came in and they sat down and uh, the, the, um, the principles that they had laid out for their time of, of washing before the meals uh, were, were set. So the water, the basin, the towels were all sitting there. They were ready to wash the dirty feet of those who had traveled on the dirty roads. And leading up to that point, the discussion going around the disciples was who is the greatest among them? And coming into that room, who is going to be the one that got to sit next to Christ? Who is going to get the best seat for themselves? That They did not notice the opportunity to serve because there was no servant there to wash the feet. They were too worried about themselves that they failed to notice that Without the servant there, it would have been their duty as the disciple, as the one being trained to wash the feet of the master, the trainer. Now, I don't know about you, but unfortunately, I have seen this in myself. Where at times I look at my own life or I go about my day thinking about how I could operate that day that is most beneficial to me and me alone. Let alone my family, let alone my neighbors, the people at my school, or the people at my work, or whatever the case may be, that I want to make the choices, I want to do the things that's going to make my life the easiest. I don't think I'm the only one. We get so concerned with what we are going to do or where we are going to go that we do not allow an opportunity to serve God because we have been too concerned with ourselves. Without that servant there at that last supper, it would have been the disciples' place to wash the feet, but they didn't. So Jesus then being that example for us, in John 13, verses 4 and 5, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And after he finished the foot washing, he returned to the table and said, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Christ recognized the issue they had then and knew that it was going to be an issue for us still today. This self-issue that he provided the ordinance of humility. It's not something we do on a regular basis. Some of us are good if we wash our own feet. Let alone try and take the time and humble ourselves to wash someone else's. Christ's example of serving others followed by that command to do as he did allows us now the opportunity to practice humility. Something, again, we desperately need. Gives us the chance to have things not be all about us and get focused on what is really important. And that is following Christ. That's having a relationship with Him and sharing it with others. For a moment, living and operating as He did, serving others, putting Himself last and others first. So what that means is, yes, today... At this very moment, 
you get the opportunity to wash somebody else's feet. We don't get to just talk about it. We get to actually practice it. That's why God told us to do it. Now, if you've never done it before, I might encourage you to watch it being done. I mean, it's not that complicated. It's an easy thing. But you're more than welcome to participate as well. I would encourage you to use this opportunity to mend any brokenness you might have with somebody else here. If we're thinking about living the life as Christ lived, that we can put ourselves to the side and elevate somebody else, we can think about what it means to live like Christ, that we take an opportunity to forgive like Christ, to move forward. Go into that foot washing with a desire for renewal. Now just as with the bread and the new wine that uh, we'll be having uh, later, the foot washing is open to all believers in Christ, whether you have church membership here in this church or not. If you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, then you are welcome to participate in the foot washing as well as with the bread and new wine later. Now, I believe that the way we have it arranged uh, today is that the fellowship hall attached here to the church is for the ladies. The room directly across the hall is for couples. And if I understand correctly, we're using the cradle roll room for the men. And again, if you would like to just come and observe, you're welcome to. But I would encourage you to participate. And after the foot washing, when we return, uh, if you can set yourselves in every other row, it would make it a lot easier to serve the bread and the new wine. And so at this time, we will have a temporary uh, dismissal to go to the foot washing.